viable system model, um, where he created the structure of an organization that would both deliver the existing product or service and design a new product or service and then make the change from the existing product or service to the new product or service. That is an adaptation of Ashby's theory. Uh, some, uh, Bateson called it double loop learning. Uh, Chris Argerus picked up on it as well. Uh, or Deutero learning, uh, learning how to learn and so forth. Um, <clears throat> but that, it's, it's a very simple of uh, theory of adaptation that if you have two nested feedback loops, uh, you can display adaptive behavior, where ad adaptive behavior is defined as simply um, not only learning, but learning that, or recognizing that your existing pattern of behavior is not working and acquiring a new pattern of behavior that does fit the new environment. Well, one inside the other. Uh, nested means that one loop is inside the other, that, that this is the one that's, that usually is operating, but when you realize that your environment has changed, then you need to completely restructure the system, in a sense reboot it, uh, zero out the existing learning, and uh, start again. Okay. Now, <clears throat> there's another important distinction in this area, and that is the difference between trivial and non-trivial systems. And my experience has been that the Europeans really think this is important, and I have a tendency to forget it, <laughs> uh, because it doesn't seem that important to me. Uh, but let me go over it, and then we can speculate on that. A trivial system is a system that always does the same thing. Uh, let's take a case of an automobile. If you turn the steering wheel to the left, you want the car to go to the left. If you turn the steering wheel to the right, you want the car to go to the right. If when you turn the wheel to the left, it goes to the left 95% of the time, and 5% of the time it goes to the right, this is not a good car, right? I mean, you'd say the car is broken. Well, what that's an indication of is that what we like is trivial systems because they're easily controlled and they're predictable. Machines that do different things at different times, sort of like teenagers, are more difficult to control, uh, they're more unpredictable, and they're more challenging to manage. Now, the reason that Heinz and other Europeans make an issue of this is that they claim that the purpose of the educational system is to change inherently non-trivial systems into trivial systems, okay? So that people come in with a variety of interests and capabilities and they all come out learning the same thing, saying the same thing, doing the same thing. Can we have a case trivia to give the terminology, cannot trivial is not a terminology? Yes. Yes, yeah, so, so trivial is like deterministic and non-trivial is non-deterministic. So that's why I think the Europeans make a big deal of trivial and non-trivial systems because they're at war with their traditional educational system which is focused very heavily on memorization and rote learning. Uh, Americans that have a more conversational, holistic, flexible, educational system, uh, I think, tend not to emphasize this concept so much. All right, well, I just went through Ashby's theory of adaptation because uh, I thought I had skipped it. Um, yeah. Okay, the, so this is the two nested feedback loops, the interior more frequent and so forth. Okay, um, going on to regulation. There are many varieties of regulation, but two major varieties of regulation are error-controlled regulation and cause-controlled regulation. 
An example of error control regulation is the feedback loop uh, on a thermostat, uh, where if this is going back to the, just thinking of this as one loop for the moment, uh, if you have the heater and then the temperature in the room and you sense the temperature in the room and then you turn the heater on or off, uh, the information is coming from the error, okay? That is, you're comparing the temperature in the room with the desired temperature. If the desired temperature is 70 degrees and uh, it's, it's, it's too hot, then you turn it off. If it's too cold, then you turn it on. Cause-controlled regulation is different. If you can imagine a thermostat that was outside the room, so that when the temperature drops outside, it anticipates that the temperature will soon drop inside and it turns on the heater. Now, in order for that to work, you have to have a relationship between the outside temperature and the inside temperature. That is, you need to know the thermodynamic or the heat transfer properties of the walls of the room to know how long it's going to take for the temperature outside to manifest itself in a change in the temperature inside, which you could get by just sort of letting the machine learn. But you end up with a different diagram. So if this is your disturbance, this is a regulator, this is the system being regulated, then your disturbance affects both. So Z is the set of output conditions, G is the goal subset. This is the system, this is the regulator, and this is the disturbance. So this is a case of cause control regulation. An example would be building schools to accommodate children. Uh, when children show up on the first day of classes, uh, you would like to have classrooms for them. And very frequently, nowadays, population is growing, uh, so you need to keep adding on to your school system at building more classrooms. If you're surprised by the number of students that show up on the first day of class, uh, you haven't been doing your job as the school superintendent because it's a simple demographic problem. You just count the number of children in the neighborhood that the school serves. And the kids don't show up until they're six years old. So you should be able to anticipate by a few years how many children you're going to have within your school district. That's a case of cause-controlled regulation, where the disturbance is the number of children, the regulator is how many classrooms are built, uh, the system is the number of classrooms, and then the question is, do you get uh, within your goal subset? But once again, that requires knowledge of a relationship between the disturbance and the classroom, which in the case of demographics is pretty simple. You just have to have a certain number of classrooms for your children. In the case of uh, heat transferring through the wall, it's more difficult. Okay, so let's go on to the law of requisite variety. This is often called Ashby's Law. Uh, it's absolutely fundamental. Uh, it's so fundamental, many people say it's trivial. <laughs> However, uh, it's a starting point. It's an axiom. It, it's a wonderful beginning for many logical arguments. There are two, variety, two ways of saying the law of requisite variety. The first is the amount of selection that can be performed is limited by the amount of information available. So it states a relationship between information and selection. The second way of stating it is that the variety in a regulator must be equal to or greater than the variety in the system being regulated. So it states a relationship between the variety in the regulator and the variety in the system being regulated. So let me give you a couple of examples. Let's say you're admitting students to a university and you have a criterion. Say it's 
3.0 grade point average. And you have five students. This one has a 3.5, 2.1, 3.2, 3.3, 4.0, 3.2, and you don't know about those. The data is missing. Well, this one gets in. This one doesn't make it. This one gets in. What do you do about those two? As you said, you can do anything you want. Usually what you do is you try to get additional information, like you look at their SAT scores or you ask for recommendations. But the point is that the law of requisite variety says that once you have used up all the information that you have, no further rational grounds for selection exists. You can let them both in, keep them both out, flip a coin. It doesn't matter. But there is a relationship between the amount of information and the amount of selection that can be performed. Now, the second version of the law of requisite variety is a relationship between the regulator and the system being regulated. Let's say you're buying a computer. How do you know which computer to buy? You can buy a very small computer or a very large computer. Well, you estimate the size of the task. Say, how much memory do I need? What speed do I need? Um, et cetera. And then you buy a computer that's at least that big, allowing for growth. It wouldn't make sense to buy a computer that's smaller than the task. Or if you're buying a truck, you estimate the load you're going to have to carry, and then you buy a truck that can hold at least that much. Buying a smaller truck, you'd have to break it up and so forth into different pieces. That's the law of requisite variety. But it, it, it's in the domain of information, not in the domain of matter and substance, as in the case of the truck. It's in the case in, in the informational domain. Now, here's an example from selling computers to China. I was told this story at a conference by a guy who worked for IBM, but he, and this was a long time ago, but he says, this, this is off the record, it's confidential, but it's a long time ago, so I don't, and I don't see any reason for it to be confidential. In any case, he worked for IBM, and China had opened up. Somebody came to him and said, China is opening up, you got nearly a billion people, figure out how we're gonna sell them computers. So he goes back to his office and he thinks about it for a while, comes back several days later and says, the market may not be as big as you think. I said, well, why? They're industrializing. He said, well, it's not just industrializing, it's how you industrialize. Like in the early days of industrialization in the United States, we had the Model T Ford. And as Henry Ford said, uh, you can have any color you want as long as it's black. All right, now, so in the early days, Everybody got exactly the same car. But by the 1950s, you could get white wall tires or not white wall tires. You could get bench seats or bucket seats. You could get automatic transmission or stick shift. You could get power steering or not power steering, power brakes, not power brakes. Many, many different def uh, uh, possibilities. You could design your own car. Well, that creates a great deal of variety. Now, if you have an assembly line and the car is going down the assembly line, you have to get the right stuff on the car. Otherwise, you might get white wall tires on it, but bucket seats when the person requested bench seats and so forth. So many things have to be coordinated, and, and to manage that variety, then you need computers. But if in China everybody's willing to accept a black car, or everybody wears Mao jackets that are the same, you don't have to control the variety. So you can have a mass production, high consumption society without computers if you're willing to accept lack of variety in styles, colors, shapes, sizes, and so forth. And it's only if you have a high value of variety, or you use variety to compete with your competitors, if you use color and choice to compete with your competitors, then you need computers. But if you don't have competitors, what do you need variety for? Okay. Now, there's the Conan and Ashby theorem. 
which is derived from the law of requisite 